presented in YouTube previously. And yeah, let's just talk about that. So basically, Open Zeppelin, if you already, uh, if you don't know us yet, we do security for the blockchain space. Uh, we published an um, open source library that we maintain with the most, uh, the, the highest security standards out there. So if you probably have done some solidity in the past, you probably know us, right? So cool. Um, aside from that, in the Beatle, Beatle, uh, Beatle Week Hackathon, we have some bounties for you to, to take a look to. This is basically using our platform, which is Defender, uh, and it's focused on developer security operations. So you can just plug whatever um, project you are making, and once you, you, you have it done in Defender, you are participating. It's quite easy to set up, and we have some templates for using it with serverless, but that is another topic. Okay, so as I mentioned, you may, just, you may already know us because of the library of contracts, but we also have some other open source efforts. In these open source efforts, you will see that we have some other libraries, and that's what we are going to talk about today, which is the Merkle tree library that we just released in past November. And I'm going to tell you about the reasons why we released this library, and a cool story about uh, hacking Merkle trees, right? Cool. So before starting, a um, quick presentation of myself. My name is Ernesto Garcia. You can find me on Twitter with um, Ernesto GNW. And also, I work at Twitter. Uh, uh, Sorry, I worked at Google before as an intern. I worked at the Google Cloud and Google Chrome teams. And now I work at Open Zeppelin as a smart contract developer. I work at the library, so if you have any question regarding to it, we can, you can find us at, at our booth and I can answer you any question you have, okay? So let's get started um, and let's start by asking this question, which is, what is a Merkle tree? So probably some of you already know what is a Merkle tree. Uh, a Merkle tree is basically a data structure that allows us to save information in a compressed way in a smart contract, right? So you don't need to put all of the information in the smart contract. You just have to put uh, the root hash, and that is enough to verify that some element is part of this Merkle tree. Um, going to the definition uh, is this one, and as you can see, it is a tree. Uh, this is very bad, in which every leaf, of course there are leaves, is labeled with a cryptographic hash of a data block. Um, what does this mean? Maybe you don't know because this, this is quite complex to, to grasp at, at first. But let me tell you how Merkle trees work in a very simple way. So we start with a set of data, which uh, was called a data block in the definition. And let's say we have elements from A to I, like A, B, C, D, including any piece of information, okay? So by starting with this, we can hash the information that is in, in that leaf and convert it to a piece of information that we can use for further uh, merging each value. So in this way, we can like build up a tree, as you can see, and this tree will have a root state in which the root state is the hash of all the values that were contained in the Merkle tree. Of course, not all of the information about the elements in the Merkle tree stay in the root state, especially because the root state is just like an identifier of the information that is in the Merkle tree, right? This is important because by using a root state, that is enough for you to verify information on chain. And this is because uh, one assumption that we have around hashes, which is that you cannot know the pre-image of a hash, which is what you put into a function of a hash, and uh, in order to get something else, right? You cannot know it beforehand. Uh, that's the way hash works. So talking about hash functions, you will see, or maybe you already know, that a function is basically just a piece of information, or let's call it like a transition function in which you map some values from a domain into a codomain, right? Um, one of the main properties of these uh, hashes is that the, the inverse operation, which is like mapping from the codomain to the domain, is not possible that easy. It's, uh, well, it's actually possible, it's just that it's not feasible and, and yeah, it will take ages. So the idea is that a good hash, it is assumed to have what we call um, the pre-image no, knowledge resistance, which is that you don't know what to put in the hash in order to get a desired result on the other side. So put, to put some graphics on that, this is the way the function works. You put some pre-image, you hash it, and you get an image after that. 
the opposite operation is what is not possible. So we rely on this assumption for multiple operations using hash. And this has something to do with the Merkle tree, because in the Merkle tree, you can start with the data and then build up to the root of the Merkle tree, right? This is useful because in this way you can prove you have values with just doing a computation that is uh, a log n of the total amount of elements in the Merkle tree. The interesting thing is that you cannot do the opposite. I mean, you cannot start with the root state and then get the values by, like, let's say, unhashing the root state. That is not possible, and that is like all of the security around the Merkle tree, right? Cool. Let's talk about proofs, which is uh, basically now that you know how a Merkle tree works, now you have to publish probably a proof on chain using open sampling contracts on it or any other tooling. So in order to build a proof, we have to first define what is a proof for a Merkle tree, right? And a Merkle, uh, a Merkle proof for a Merkle tree works in the following way. So you basically start with a, with a piece of information that you want to prove that is in a Merkle tree. And in this case, it's called B. And let's say it's a tuple between address and U, U in 256. So we take this value, we apply a hash function, and then that we have, now that we have this uh, hash value of our original element, we can start building our tree. How is this done? In the following way. We start with our hash value of B, and then we can get rid of C and D. Why? Because it's not completely related to the piece of inform information we want to know. So we start by hashing the hash of B and the hash of A, which is part of the proof. Okay, with these two, we get the third one, and now we need the hash of CD, which then we combine, and then eventually we get the root state. So that is the way in which we can prove information about uh, what information being in a Merkle tree, and this is amazing because it can be done in uh, log n of the total amount of, of elements, which is quite handy when you are like managing a lot of information that you have to put on chain. Okay, so this is the root state, and if you compare it to, what if, to what's on chain or to what you have put in a smart contract, you can validate that information is correct. So this is basically how they work. And some things to consider is that in order to make a proof, you have to make an array of values. As you can see, these are, these are the values that we needed for, starting from B to combine with A and then with CD. So you have a proof that is not the total amount of elements, but is good enough to process on chain. The way you process it is, as I mentioned, you take the leaf, you hash it, and then you combine the next hashes, so you end up having this root, okay? Amazing, so now let's uh, have a look into what a proof like this looks in Solidity because it's quite different, especially when you are like working with JavaScript because you have like a library that is uh, creating Merkle proofs or hashes of like any function that you want. But maybe the format and the types of these uh, pieces of information don't match directly with whatever is in Solidity, right? So we identify that as a problem and a, a big problem from the developer experience standpoint. So basically, we decided to like do some research on what are the main pain points around building Merkle trees and verifying on chain. And basically, what we uh, what we notice is that there is a big mismatch between the information that is in the let's say front end. If you have one and you are using JavaScript, you have to interact with values that are Solidity native. Like for example, a bytes 32, which is representing uh, the array of proofs. Uh, well, not proofs or the path to make the Merkle proof, right? So this is not like directly mapped to JavaScript, and this is something that especially beginners don't know exactly how to translate because you have data types in JavaScript and then you have different data types in Solidity. So what we figure out is that number one, developer experience is complex. Number two, there is no connection between the types. I mean, there are numbers in JavaScript, but we all have headaches with big number, for example. And how do you convert a big number into a bytes 32 in a secure way? That is one question that you might have if you are starting with this. Um, aside from that, we found out that, uh, that the interoperability with the tooling that is already used, such as Ether.js, is also not quite uh, familiar, especially for, for this kind of uh, verification process. 
And finally, the most important thing, which is the second pre-image attack that I'm gonna tell you about next. So cool, uh, right now we know how Merkle trees work. So let's say that we have a piece of information called i, right? The way we prove that is in the Merkle tree is by hashing this function. And this is what we uh, call the pre-image of the initial hash, right? So we take the i value, we hash it into hi, and then look at this. We have a second pre-image for the next, uh, the next hash. Why? Because we already know what h of y and h of i is, because that is part of the proof, right? So the problem that comes with this is that someone can actually do something like this, which is taking one of the nodes and use it to prove information that is not actually true, right? You just have to provide this node and the proof or, or the path to build uh, a fake proof using it. So although in most of the contexts in which this is a problem, it is not actually malleable because it, uh, it, it usually depends on the message that sender. So you have to figure out a message that sender that for some reason has to, um, has the same like uh, configuration as uh, one of the pre-image pre you have. But still, the risk is, um, let's call it like, at least probable enough to take care of it, right? So we didn't found, find any contract out there using this, this mechanism, so this is basically just a theoretic attack, so please don't go and try to figure out how to hack someone using this, right? But the problem is that, yes, in fact, we have a flaw. It's something that is not quite uh, evident for the user, especially when you are just like trying to do an NFT drop or something, you don't care about pre-images and things like that, right? So based on that, uh, we decided to, okay, let's take a look to what is the common process of uh, Merkle distributions for an NFT or, or, or an airdrop, and it always looks something like this, right? You have a function, let's call it claim, or let's call it mint, of, or ho however you want, that is taking a proof, and this proof is validated using our, uh, our Merkle proof library that we have in Open Zeppelin, right? So, so far, so good uh, until this point, but the problem is that, uh, as you can see, in this case, someone can like mint 100 tokens because they have a proof that is an actual valid proof, but since the second pre-image is known, you can actually use these two to mint a ridiculous amount of tokens that is produced by the randomization of the hash function, right? So this is, as, as I said, this is not that useful because you will end up sending the tokens to an address that is uh, unusable. You don't have the private key. But if you think about it, you are like inflating um, the supply of a system, which is not ideal. And of course, we want to avoid that, um, that problem. So the, what happened is that we decided to like close the gap between what is going on in JavaScript and people that is building Merkel airdrops or NFT drops, and like make a whole end-to-end -end process easy for developers to use. So this is how we came up with this library, and this library is basically an end-to-end -end approach of using and validating Merkle trees. So you can take a look at Open Zeppelin slash Merkle tree. Uh, it is published on NPM. It's already like quite used by the community, uh, and also. Like we have figured out that multiple people find it like really easy to use, is way better than other alternatives, and it's pretty straightforward when you're working with smart contracts. So the way it works is, um, oh, sorry, some properties first and design decisions we, we take before creating the library. So number one, we decided that the tree should be shaped as a complete binary tree. This means that the only part that is incomplete of the tree is the, le the, the last level of the tree. And this is for security reasons. There are some considerations around uh, unbalanced Merkle trees that you may want to avoid. So what we did is, okay, let's just balance this, um, this Merkle tree automatically. Whenever you are adding information using the library, that's already done. So you don't have to take care about it. Uh, point number two, the libs are, are sorted. And this is because the order in which you hash the things matters. So, Basically, people can make mistakes in which they hash values in a different order, and they are not able to get a correct proof, or let's, let's call it, they publish a proof that is incorrect on chain, and they cannot change it anymore, okay? So it's, I, I mean, the developer experience of that, as I said, 
was like not the best one. So right now, if you use this library, you will get everything sorted out for you. Uh, point number three is that the libs are the result of, uh, of an ABI encoding, which means that everything that you do in, in JavaScript is going to be like fully compatible with anything you do on Solidity. So you have native support uh, between conversion of types, or you can use directly the types that you will use in Solidity, such, an, such as an address, or an integer, uh, an UIN256 could be. Also, we are using the Keshack256 function that is already built in in most of the tooling, and that is also already built in in Ethereum. There is a pre-compile for that, so people can just use it. And finally, the libs are double hashed, and this is to prevent the second frame image attack. And I'm gonna explain how this like uh, removes that possibility from the scope. So. How is this prevented? Basically, we take a piece of information, and instead of doing one hash, we do two. Why? Because if you hash it twice, it means that there is a fundamental difference between a node that is a leaf and a node that is an intermediary node. Why? Because every leaf is hashed twice, so if you try to use a, a second pre attack, you will just hash it once, and the system will only do it once, right? So the whole idea is like, let's hash it again so people don't know what the pre-image is. That's it, okay? It's already built in. It's usually one design decision that developers need to make before creating a system like that, so we decided to just put it built in in the library. Um, to exemplify, uh, exem exemplify, yeah, how this works, basically we have uh, the same example that I show you in which you have a piece of information called A, you hash it, and then you get a pre-image. But the thing is, this pre-image is double hashed, as you can see. So right now, if you take this same example, you will see that the next hash is not going to match because the first uh, hashing in the claim function that you have in Solidity will hash it twice. So th there will be a mismatch, naturally, and this avoids any attack like that. Uh, let me go back here because I see some people is confused. But as you can see here, in line, oh, there is no number of lines, but <laughs> here you can see we are just hashing once. If we hash twice, we avoid any pre-image attack because no pre-image is known for a double hash. You see what I mean? There is only known pre-image double hash for the leaf values, which, is, uh, which are the values that, are, that we care about, okay? Going back to this, I hope now this makes more sense. Is it? Cool. Amazing. So the verification will basically fail because, yeah, if you try to hash twice a pre-image that is supposed to be hashed once, it's not going to work. That's it. Cool. So in this case, what we recommend from now on is that instead of just hashing once in your claiming function, you don't have to change anything but this line. As you can see, uh, the leaf calculation is changed by double hashing. And if you are asking why we are using these bytes that concat, it's just basically to avoid memory because otherwise you have to copy into memory and then copy again. And yeah, this is an easy way, an easy trick to not copy into memory. Cool, so now that we have this leaf, we can use it uh, with the Merkle proof library we have as we have done before without any other change, which is nice. Okay. I already explained this, but you can take pictures if you want. But this is basically the whole idea behind creating a new JavaScript library for this, is that you do not have to mess with this. Nice. And also another feature, and this is an interesting thing to talk about, is that uh, property-based testing has been uh, quite hot, I would say, in the last couple of years. And we are also trying to, that, to, add, uh, to integrate that into our development process. So this library was also created and tested with uh, property-based test, which is known for many of you as fuzzing, probably. And there are some cool libraries out there that you can use to fuzz things in JavaScript, which is nice because you always, like, usually fuzz everything that is in the smart contract, but you don't do the same with JavaScript, and usually JavaScript is also messy, right? Uh, especially in front-ends and data conversions. There are so many things that can go wrong in that place, so fuzzing in this context is also useful, especially for Merkle trees. Cool, so 
in this context, we made the Merkle tree library to match exactly with the Merkle proof library that we have in open Zeppelin contracts. And everything seems so easy since it is designed like that. Uh, here is an example of how you can build a tree. As you can see, step number one is adding values to uh, an array. And each one of these uh, array elements is corresponding to a leaf. So in this case, this is only uh, two leaves, three. And that's it. It's just an example. Um, number two, you, cons you construct the tree using our library, and you have to provide the information about the ABI, en ABI encoding for those values. So as you can see, you don't have to worry about like any conversion between data types. It is already built in. And under the hood is using Ether.js, which is what you will be using if you are like building applications on Ethereum, right? Um, step number three is calculating the root. So you can take this root and put it into a smart contract on chain and use this for validation in the future. Finally, you just have to write the, uh, the tree in any file so you can like later use it for proving that some element is, is inside it. Uh, especially when you're building frontends, um, if you already have claim an airdrop in which they use uh, Merkle tree, you probably will know that the frontend has to calculate the Merkle proof for you so you can then claim um, your airdrop, basically. Nice. Uh, as you can see, this is ABI encoded, so it's quite easy. It's the same as if you were working directly with ABIs and using any other tooling such as Web3.js or Ether.js is the same. Cool. So in order to get approved, let's say that you already built your, um, your application, you have the list of the people that is going to be benefit from the airdrop. Now you have to add it to the um, Merkle tree, loading it from a file. And this is, special, this is especially designed like this because we noticed that mul multiple people in the, in, the, in the space are using usually CSV. Why? Because it's the most easy, easiest thing to do, right? Just put everything into a CSV, export it, and let's use, a, I don't know, any front end that converts that into a Merkle tree, right? So we made it easy. Um, you can load everything from a JSON file, and I'm going to show you at the very end how you can actually parse CSV into JSON. Uh, nice. Step number two is just iterating through the, through the leaves and get the proof for each one of your leaves. And that's it. So if you have a front end, you can just plug the address of the user here, and you will get the proof for the user so they can submit it on chain. Uh, one thing that is in also important to note is that this proof that is generated is ready to put into a smart contract. I mean, if you use this to generate the proof, then you can go to a smart contract, and exactly as it was printed in the console, you can put it in Remix or in Etherscan or in the application that you are using, right? So it's immediately use, useful, and it, you, you don't need to do any, any conversion or weird stuff in the middle. It's quite easy. Uh, nice. This is the example from the Solidity perspective. As you can see, it's quite the same as I already showed you before, but it includes some, um, let's say, small differences, which is that, number one, we have to save the root state in the constructor. This, f this is for immutability purposes. We want to make sure the root is already there and nobody will change it after it's uh, published. Then we add a function for verifying, and we can put this function inside of any mean function or claim function. And what it's doing is basically calculating the leaf in the same way that we did before, and also requiring that the proof is correct, uh, which is this line. Number four, you can add all of the logic you want after that in a secure way, and that's it. You are ready to go with this uh, Merkle tree configuration. Um, Important things to know is that there is no second pre image attack, so you are safe. I mean, you don't even have to think about it because it is already included in the, in the library. And it's 100% ABI compatible the way Ether.js is. And finally, you have a great developer experience. Just a few lines of code and you're ready to go, which is pretty nice. Uh, cool. Let's do a quick demo. Let's see how much time we have. I think we have like sort of like 10 minutes, so I think it's enough for running a quick test. So. I'm going to open this repository here. Let me make some zoom. Is that OK? Amazing. Thank you. So as you can see, I have a CSV file here 
that includes the same example in the, in the presentation, right? It includes the types as headers of the CSV and then the values comma separated. Um, it's quite easy. You can export something like this from Excel or Google Spreadsheet, whatever is fine, and it's quite easy to use. So here I have two scripts. One of these is uh, for building the tree, and the other one is for actually generating the proof. And if we take a look, the build tree should look almost exactly as the uh, example that I showed you before. The only difference is that we are reading from the values.csv, and we are converting the CSV into a simple JSON that we can then input into our library for building Mer Merkle trees. So what this is going to do is to like separate each, each line. Let me put each line aside. Okay. So as you can see, what this is doing is like removing any extra space because for example, this uh, four right here is an empty line, we don't need it. And then we split four lines. So we end up with an array of values in which the first values are the data types uh, equivalent to ETHRJS. And the rest of the values are just the leaves of the Merkle tree. So the way we create a Merkle tree is by calling the standard Merkle tree that of function, just mapping the leaves uh, and separating because they are like comma separated, we have to make them into an array, that's it. Um, so I'm encoding here, we print the Merkle root and then we can use that to put it into a smart contract. Cool, so let's try it out. I'm gonna open my terminal and also some, some zoom. So is that okay? Yes, nice. So what we have to do if you want to like check it out, you have some instructions here. You just have to basically like populate the CSV and then run this command and you will get uh, the Merkle root, right? So you can put this into your smart contract and then give proofs to everyone so they can claim their, their tokens or their NFTs, they can do it. Cool, so now that we have this uh, Merkle root, the next thing we have to do is generating a proof, okay? So a proof is, um, it, it's a way to, well, actually prove that some data is there, but you have to actually provide what data of the tuple you are trying to prove for. Why? Because we have two values for each leaf, which is the address and an amount, what if we want to generate a proof for an address? So we have to point out to the first element of the leaf, right? That is why we uh, provide a type index, which is referring to the first value, and then a value, which is the, um, how do you call it? Um, yeah, the, it's, it's not a proof, it's the value that we're looking for, the address in this case. It will all make sense when I run it. So let's just run it with npm run generate proof, and as you can see, since uh, each tuple is consistent of two values, okay, what I'm trying to prove for, actually I think I need to run with, with a zero here, because this is the type index of the first element, which is the address, right? So we want to generate a proof for, for the address, one, 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 and this is the way we do it. Let's see if it works, yes. So here you go, you have the value, and you have the proof. Uh, this proof is just one element because the, the, um, the Merkle tree we made is quite simple, but if you want to extend this into like multiple things, you can try it out. Uh, just make sure you put different values in here because otherwise it could be um, a problem in the way we calculate the proof, especially because we don't know exactly which one of the elements you have because they are duplicated. That is something to consider. Okay, so that's basically it. This is the way you can plug everything into your front end in an easy way. Um, so yeah, let us know any comments and feel free to open issues in the repository. Uh, I'm gonna be here around for any questions you have, so thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions?